So now in this final look at the digestive pathway, we'll entitle the next flowchart digestive pathway. And this will be the final part of this series four, digestive pathway four. We finished before by looking at the small intestine, lots of absorption, lots of digestion as well. So now let's go to the next compartment of this overall one-way tube, and that is the large intestine. So let's do this as number six, large intestine. So in order to get to the large intestine, which is also commonly just referred to as the colon, you have to, of course, utilize a sphincter. And the sphincter that's utilized here is called the ileocecal, because of the ileum that's, that's at the end of the small intestine, from the small intestine to the large intestine, you have to go through a valve called the ileocecal sphincter. So the ileocecal sphincter will be the one that serves as an opening and closing a valve from the small intestine to the large intestine. So now, just to reiterate, why is this called the large intestine? This is the large intestine because it has a larger diameter than the small intestine, but it actually has a shorter length overall. Okay, So be careful when you talk about large versus small intestine. This has a larger diameter, but a smaller length, and um, be able to differentiate between the two sizes of the intestines. In addition, the large intestine, much like the small intestine, will be divided into parts. And there are four major divisions of the large intestine. Let's take a look. Here, they are uh, named as follows. The first division is known as the ascending colon, which would just mean the colon, the part of the large intestine that's going up. And then the large intestine goes to the side. It goes from ascending colon, then right, to left to right. That is called the traverse colon. Number two would be the traverse colon. And then number three, it's going to go down, which would now be called the descending colon. And then finally, at the end, it will have this sort of sigmoidal shape. Therefore, it's called the sigmoid colon. So we have four divisions that are going to span the large intestine. So it's a short structure, just a very large diameter to it. Ascending, traverse, descending, and sigmoid. Okay. In addition, in terms of functionality, the large intestine is going to serve as a very, very major site of water absorption. The majority of water that is absorbed from the whatever is being whatever you consume, that water absorption will happen usually at the large intestine. This is the major site and major function of this organ within the digestive pathway. The large intestine also contains many, many beneficial bacteria. Lots of beneficial, beneficial means good, helpful. Bacteria are going to live here. These are our commensal bacteria, bacteria that are in concord with us, that help us and we help them by providing them a safe liver, I mean large intestine habitat, and they give us some nutrients as a result of this. How do they do this? Well, what they do for us is that as a sort of rent that they pay to us by living in us is that they produce very absorbable vitamins for us. So we need vitamins. These are cofactors of reactions that happen throughout our body. We need those. And the beneficial bacteria that are found within the large intestine are good at making them. Those vitamins include things like vitamin K, also includes vitamins like thiamine, also includes riboflavin, and even vitamin B12. These are all going to be critically important vitamins, cofactors, things that help other reactions go towards the correct product, from the reactants to the products. And that's why they're useful for us in our overall metabolic processes. In addition, because there's so many of these beneficial bacteria within us, they basically take up so much space that they outcompete any dangerous bacteria, any malignant bacteria. So they outcompete pathogens. So pathogens cannot survive in this nice um, large intestine environment because there's too many of the good guys there in the first place. So they basically outcompete them. In addition, this is going to basically be the end of the line of the digestive pathway because this is where we have elimination. 
Remember how we had uh, four steps in food processing? We had the ingestion, digestion, absorption, and elimination. Elimination is of feces. Feces is our final eliminated product. Okay, But I want to make sure something is clear here. There's a distinction between language that you need to be aware of. Feces is always going to be eliminated, not excreted. Not excreted. Excreted is the wrong term. It's absolutely the wrong term to use here. You have to use elimination when you're referring to feces being removed from the body. This is because excretion involves a totally separate process, both biological and physiological. So we're going to actually look at excretion in a separate lecture. That's a whole different process. That's mainly the urination side. But elimination is when you get rid of feces. And feces is going to be the structure, the component, the final sort of end-all, be-all product that is going to undergo elimination, as we've said. Why is this eliminated? Because we, as organisms, have to get rid of digestive waste. We cannot just hold on to it. It's waste. It's dead, dead matter. It's not useful for us to keep it within us. It's actually toxic. So we're going to get rid of any digestive waste. Things that could not be digested or were not digested. Basically, material that is not part of our metabolism. Any material that will not be part of metabolism. And remember, metabolism involves two processes, breaking down things and building up things. Catabolism and anabolism, both of those are not going to be utilized for this feces material. So we have to eliminate it, get rid of it. And so it actually has to go through a sphincter because this is the end. And in order to go out of the body, it has to leave through an opening. And that's going to be a valve that's controlled. And this is passed out via the anal sphincter. Now, remember how I've been saying that we do not have control over our sphincters? Well, one of the sphincters that we have some, what, some control over, some sort of voluntary control over, is the anal sphincter. Because we can at least control when we are going to eliminate and when we are not because of the idea of potty training, right? So there's a bit of control that we have, but once the anal sphincter opens, then there's no control that we have left over it. Sort of like um, you have that action potential uh, all or none phenomenon. We have a bit of control over this due to something like potty training. Just a fun fact for you. Um, the anal sphincter will get rid of this waste, this feces. That will be consisting of 75% H2O and 25% solid waste. So we will absorb a lot of the water, but we'll also get rid of some of the water in this feces material. And so the solid waste that's re released, this is mainly going to consist of things like dead bacteria, bile salts, dead cells, cellulose, fiber, anything that we couldn't digest basically will be gotten rid of through this large intestine. And that's basically the end of the digestive path 